In case you hadn't noticed, there's little discussion these days in Christian circles about the age of the earth. And uh, to begin, it's more than a little discussion. <laughs> it's a full-blown argument, and here to discuss that with us today is author and lecturer Steve Quayle. Hi, Steve. Hi, Gary. This is one of the most important teachings in the Old Testament that leads into the New and brings us right to the book of Revelation. When God says, "He behold, he makes all things new, and there's going to be a new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, there is a wonderful window into the past when we read the first three verses of Genesis chapter 1. Because in Genesis chapter 1, in the first three verses, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That sounds something very unusual. Something's happened. Because again, the correct syntax of this in my understanding of people who read Hebrew, I don't. I know you do. But the point is, is that it really says, and the earth had become, or the earth was wasted, or the earth was judged. Mm-hmm. Because you never see desolation apart from God's judgment. Absolutely. And the Bible opens on that note, which begs the discussion. Uh, why? How? What happened? Something terrible happened. Well, The war in heaven that took place when a third of the angels rebelled with Lucifer and the statements of Jesus that he saw Lucifer fall like lightning, the thing is is that it tells me that there was a war footing. You know, as a student of ancient history, and I tell people prehistory, and when you tell them pre-Adamic history, they go nuts. But in the Sumerian table of kings, you have kings recorded that live 65,000 years or 45,000 years, and it goes back, I think, 450,000 years. There is a period of time in which civilization, ancient civilization, built on a scale beyond what we know now with technology we're just trying to uh, acquire the knowledge of now, that there was a world before the judgment on that world, and it's what the Golden Age, people refer to it as Atlantis, I mean different places, Lemuria, Mu, M-U in the South Pacific, yeah. all of the Shangri-La, Shambhala, and... Yeah, the Greeks called it Arcadia. Arcadia. Yeah, the, the, it was the perfect world, it was paradise, right. and then there was a war among the gods, the Titans and the Olympians, and the wreckage of that war is, is what we see today. Mythology always has to build on a building block of some fact, but legends take a little different. Uh, oh, a little they go in a different direction, and the reason they go in a different direction is because there's usually more empirical data to back up the legend than there is when it comes to just simply a myth. Well, they'll say, "Oh, that's just a myth." No, a legend has more, if you will, foundational history to support it. And so when we go to Jeremiah 4, when we start at verse 23, it says this, Jeremiah speaking, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. For thus saith the Lord, verse 27, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. Hmm. People see that, and you've got to say, cities? There is no man, no Adam in the Hebrew. And so what is this civilization that so provoked God that he speaks in his anger? And like I said, there is never desolation without judgment proceeding. Right. There's never. So what we have in the first uh, uh, chapter of the Bible in Genesis, in the first three verses, is a picture, so much is contained in it, 
but something happened to make the earth waste. Yeah, and verse 1 of Genesis, everybody knows this. In the, be- in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, or the heavens and the earth. Second verse, and the earth, it says in the King James, was without form and void. But actually in the Hebrew it says, and the earth became without form and right. void. In Hebrew, tohu vabohu. Uh, tohu means patternless. Having no, and when you build a building it has a pattern. When you build anything, it, you, know, you have the blueprint, you have a wonderful pattern. Tohu means the pattern is busted, it's taken away. There's nothing that, right. that has any semblance of regularity. And bohu means wreckage. So the earth became tohu vabohu, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now where there is darkness, there, there is not God. The presence of God was removed. And then the next sentence says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So here th- you're reading in three verses a narrative of something that happened, and you can take it from there. Well, the triplexity of it, and, and instead of a complexity, we're trying to deal with three different ideas right now, and the Bible lays them out very clearly, in my opinion. On casual reading, people would be confused, going, well, how can it be this when it says this, and so what does that mean? Every single myth, legend, oral tradition goes back to a time, as you said, they called it Arcadia, the Greeks, yeah. but a time of perfection. Into that place of perfection comes a rebellion against God. I'm talking about an angelic rebellion. I'm talking about legendary places that even Plato spoke about, that the gods, it was a fair place until the gods, obviously he wasn't a... Uh, believer in the God of heaven, but judged it because the, the the inhabitants went into realms that were forbidden to mortals. And and Gary, as we talked off camera earlier, the genetic manipulation of the genome, and, and God created the prior um, inhabitants of a pre-Adamic earth, obviously they weren't created in the same thing, image and likeness. Bible says he maketh his angels ministers of ministering flames of fire. But out of us, meaning out of the dirt, he made us. But he, something's interesting. He breathed into Adam, you know, the clay man, yes. the breath of life. Adam explodes with the awareness that with all the access to the intelligence of the living God, and that's where we start, and that's why you can, you can bring the two time frames together. So, you know, when you're dealing with 6,000 years versus... Uh, you know, the dateless past, it reconciles those two images. Now, I don't understand, because I guess I'm kind of this, the non-religious guy, why everything that's easy and plain to some people is obtuse and hidden. Good example, the word replenish. Well, the word replenish, if I use the word replenish, I say, okay, Gary, uh, we just ran out of gas, we got to go to the gas station and replenish. What is that word in Hebrew, and what does that mean? Well, it simply means to restore that which was uh, depleted. Yep. That's exactly what it means. So if it's to replenish the earth, that which was depleted, you keep going back to why, why, why. And I think that brings us to Isaiah 14. I believe in that's where we need to go. Now, it's also interesting that as you study geology, geophysics, studying... uh, Astral catastrophes, the stuff in the the heavens, it seems like God uses heavenly bodies to judge other heavenly bodies to bring, in essence, just on earth as you would stone a sinner in the Old Testament, yeah. God used his ability to move planets, to move, he can do whatever he wants. But the remnants of judgment in the KP layer, you know, iridium layer, all of the craters, the vitrified glass in some of the deserts, there's some horrific event that modern history doesn't deal with, but prehistory writes volumes about it. And the volumes about it deal with this war. And even in the ancient uh, Hindu poems, uh, poetic narratives, the Vedas, they talk about this war that took place in the heavens where celestial beings are at war and the, the power of 10,000 suns or whatever is being used against each. And, and it talks about a time of wiping out that which was. Mm-hmm. So when you've got all this, listen, here's something that people need to understand. It wasn't millions of years ago or hundreds of thousands of years ago when the nations, the actual continents split. 
But in Genesis 10, when it talks about that God split the earth in the days of Peleg, that's a pretty interesting thing. He separated the land masses. He did. And you know, there have been other catastrophes that are obvious to the, just to the uh, casual observer. Gulf of Mexico, 150-mile diameter crater called Cheeks Loop. When did that happen? Uh, we have crater in Canada. It's 25 miles in diameter called Chubb Crater. When did that happen? Uh, and you start looking at the catastrophes, the craters of the moon, uh, and the astronauts went there and they discovered that there had been uh, a number of catastrophes uh, and the lunar soil reflected that. So what I'm saying is <clears throat> there's, there was a dark, dark turn in, in man's ancient past. And to fully understand the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning and see what the problem was, how the Lord fixed it, and how you are a part of the repair. That's, that's what we're talking about. Well, and it's also an answer to evolution. Yep. It's an answer to the attacks on the faith. Because quite candidly, most, and I'll say this, I, from my experience, 45, 46 years walking with the Lord, the, most Christians are afraid to take on the evolutionists in their own realm the anthropologists in their own realm. And I'll tell most people out there, you look at the history of anthropology uh, and you're looking at fraud and you're looking at a single bone that all speculation. So anthropologists exhibit more faith and incomplete evidence than the Christian stands in his faith on plenty of evidence. Right. So again, the, the attack on Christians is number one to intimidate. The ammunition that we're going to give the brethren if they'll prayfully, uh, excuse me, the ammunition we're going to give the brethren if they'll prayerfully consider this can stand up against any argument. And, and you know that, Gary, because sure. you see it. You, you experience it. If you're on the wrong side of the gap thing, you're an enemy. If, you, if you're with the good old boys, I'm sorry, that's what I'll call them. Gary Sturman's not saying that, I'm saying that. <laughs> okay. if, you're with the, if you're with the good old boys, as long as you agree, you know, I guess it's coffee time. Well, Isaiah wrote about the tribulation, and I think it's very interesting. Isaiah, in Isaiah 24, wanted to depict the horrors of the tribulation. And what words did the Lord give him? He said, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste. Tohu va bohu. It's the exact same words that you find in Genesis. And then Isaiah just goes on to describe the coming tribulation of the Lord, but he begins with that sentence. Uh, the earth, <clears throat> the Lord makes the earth tohu, and he makes it bohu, and turns it upside down, scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. And then he goes on to say this includes everybody. Nobody's left out. This is the judgment that is coming. And he, by use of words, says that the coming judgment is going to be a reflection of that incredible past judgment. A second witness. Yeah. As it was in the beginning, so it will be in the end. Right. And God's word declares that he alone is God, declaring the end at the beginning. Indeed. He, and does he not speak it forth? Does it not come to pass? And you know, Gary, this is fascinating because we're seeing in the book of Job some amazing revelations. For instance, Pleiades, the seven sisters, the constellation. Job is asked by God himself, consider the gentle influence of Pleiades. If Pleiades, as many light years away as it is from, uh, I was going to say from us, then it's got to be pretty amazing just that, if you will, that gentle influence, the perfect, if you will, the most complex uh, embraceable thoughts in us as human beings, trying to grasp the eternal definition of that yeah. by the mouth of God. And, wow. and it, it, it can't be done. The only way anybody can embrace that, and I believe that God will give us wisdom, but King David, I think, had the best answer. He said, I won't exercise myself in matters too great for me. Wow. <laughs> what a statement. Yeah. And something we should all remember, by the way. But what we're talking about here is the setting for the greatest story ever told. And it's, it's like a, uh, <clears throat> a novel. If I gave you a novel, and you're going to really enjoy this novel, I'm going to rip off chapter 1, I'm going to rip off chapter 35, which is the last chapter, and I'm going to give you the novel. Have fun. Read the novel. And you say, I want the whole book. And that's what you need when you read the Bible. You want the whole book. 
Amen. And a lot of people have their, their places that they focus that bring them hope and peace and so forth. But you need to read the whole book. Well, I think Jesus said, lo, him speaking, Jesus said, lo, he, Jesus, comes in the volume of the book, it is written of him. And then John says, of all the books that have ever been written, all of them that have ever been written couldn't even contain everything that Jesus has done. Yeah. And Jesus did. You know, so the thing is, is that in Proverbs chapter 8, the very wisdom of God that's being described there is Jesus. Because we're, no, we're told in, uh, what is it, either First or Second Corinthians, that, that God made, Jesus is the wisdom of God. God made Jesus the wisdom of God for us. We know that he's the one that created all things in the book of Colossians. Yes. That by him and through him do all things consist that exist. And therefore, the, the knowledge of the total creative process of everything that's gone before him would come after him and the total redemption that God would make available to those who would accept Jesus is mind-boggling. Here's what I tell people. Will not the author and finisher of our faith, just like a novelist, make it so we can follow it from beginning to end? There may be twists and there may be turns, the biggest being Lucifer who became Satan. Mm -hmm. But God is the author and finisher. Absolutely. Now, we've, we've sort of laid out a, a basic pattern here <clears throat> uh, that God has, because of his incredible integrity, he has to judge evil, even though God is love. When evil presents itself and when there is a revolution, as there was uh, in the days when Satan fell, Halel, he was called, the Prince of Light, and uh, uh, we call him Satan, and uh, he still owns, I think, probably the solar system. He in, he owns the earth. He he tempted Jesus by saying, you know, if you bow down to me, I'll just give you this whole thing, which means that he still has ownership, uh, but he's losing it fast. And all of of this began when he rebelled in the ancient past. And this is what you're driving at. This is what I'm driving at. This is the point you start from once you get there. Now that almost sounds like a, an oxymoron. This is the place in Genesis that you start from, but you've got to get here by understanding what went on there. Yeah. Because the only way to articulate how we got in this mess, this mess being sin, obviously we see a planet ready for judgment. We're seeing in the, uh, the uh, sun, moon, and stars, we're seeing the signs that we were told to look at. The volcanoes of the earth are coming active. We've got so many events that are leading up to this crescendo moment. I love the word crescendo. Mm, yeah. Because it's building towards this crescendo. But again, any ingredient for a recipe, God's given us a recipe for redemption. I'm not belittling that in any way. But he's also laying out where the ingredients were derived from. You know, people will say, I want this, and by the way, I don't cook. I mean, it's a disaster. My wife is a wonderful cook. But, you know, the, the ginger is this kind of ginger, or all the different spices come from this, and you got to get the right spice, and you got to get the right everything to get the right meal. She doesn't throw stuff together, okay? Neither does God. There is the sequential laying out of the battle. We're in a battle for our lives. Paul yes. talks about it, yet people don't. I, I, I make the statement, 90%, maybe that's too generous, 99% of pastors who quote Ephesians 6 don't understand the nature of the battle, but it's even beyond that, Gary. If you understand the origin of the battle, then you understand the enemy. If you understand the enemy, you obviously study his tactics. If you study his tactics, then you know how to confront. Unfortunately, we're just clueless and therefore we cannot come at this point until God does something in my opinion I tell people God's got to first move in them and on them before he can move through them and he's moving through the scripture to bring people I'm, I'm, I'm praying literally as you said there's a war you said let's say uh, an argument going on over the gap theory and over the new earth theory and they're both it's not either or it's both yeah one one pre-existed the other and to go on, and as Isaiah 24, uh, verse 20, uh, Isaiah paints this incredible picture hearkening back to that huge destruction of earth uh, that opens the Bible. And, and, and he talks about the Lord makes the earth uh, tohu vabohu. 
And dropping down in that same chapter to verse 20, he says, The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, shall be removed like a cottage. The transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it. It shall fall and not rise again. And wow, what could he be talking about? He's talking about the day of the Lord here. In other words, the institutions of the world are going to be totally shattered. And there will be no recovery from that. But And Isaiah uses, to make his point, he uses the model of this first destruction. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth. And I think those high ones on high are the fallen angels who left their first estate. There seems to be confusion on how, again, when, when you look at the book of Obadiah, one chapter, and there's one verse in there that's perplexing, and most people don't address it. And God says, though you set your nest amongst the stars, yet will I bring you down. And you know that Hebrew sure. is the teaching of stars, and you know the teaching of the abode of angels. Right. And so when sin entered the human race, all of that evil basically defaced the image of God. But prior to that, there's still the functional sin that has to be dealt with. In other words, God dealt with our sin on earth through the person of Jesus Christ. But the heavenly sin, he says, basically, I'm going to roll it up like a scroll, and behold, I make a new heaven, a new earth. And Peter says the old earth is going to pass away with fervent heat. And so the idea is this, that even the scriptures define the old earth. They're talking about that time that that most Christians don't know existed. And in my book, Genesis 6 Giants, that we've talked, I deal with the whole thing of tohu bohu. I quote exegete it. And yeah. it's, it's a very good foundational thing. By the way, the cover of this is the Temple of Zeus. And if you look at the giants in there, the people are about, they come up to the guy's shin bone. That's the size. <laughs> Yes, <clears throat> and there were giants in the earth in those days. Let's face it, the Bible says so. You know, what's uh, the purpose uh, of this study? And I'm, I'm holding up Steve's book, Genesis 6, Giants. Uh, the purpose is to point out the very obvious fact that God's way of dealing with sin has to be understood on a cosmic level. Amen. And a lot of us don't go to that level. You have to understand what drove the original fall. And uh, apparently there was a par an absolute paradise that was shattered by rebellion in the heavens. And when that happened, God took action to rebuild the earth. And we are the product of the first couple that he created, Adam and Eve. And, and usually, and Stephen, wouldn't you agree that usually people start with Adam and Eve? They don't go back any farther than that. Right, because they're not taught, Gary. You can't have ignorance in the pulpit producing brilliance in the congregation. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I'll give you the scripture. Study they show thyself approved unto God. In my opinion, you'll agree, you're, you've been a minister, but it's a calling. It's not an, yeah. an employment opportunity. Every man of God should be able to say, I know when God called me to do what I'm doing or you're doing. But everybody uses the word too loosely, a minister of this, a minister of that. And basically a minister, doesn't the word in Greek mean a messenger? Yeah, it does. Or a caretaker as well. It has both aspects in it. Uh, someone who is appointed to, uh, to make sure things run smoothly. Uh, and we use that term, you know, a, uh, someone who ministers to your health, uh, someone who can minister to your spiritual condition. Uh, it is almost a position of servitude uh, that I'm, I am pledged to serve you on your behalf. And it's not a pyramid with the pastor at the top. Right. It's a base, and the people are always brought before the Lord. I remember a, a, a writer of a song, he said, uh, you know, Jesus was put down that God would raise me up. He meant in the grave, but God didn't leave him there. Yeah. Hallelujah, the grave is empty. And that's something really important. Ezekiel 28, I just got to say this, okay? There is no clearer definition than the war we're talking about than in Ezekiel 28. And the point of this is talking about, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. There's nobody on earth that fits that description, That's yet right. Lucifer was. 
Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. God sets a record. Lucifer was created. He was charged with the worship of God. He was the shining one. And it talks about his bringing down. You are the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Some people, and I'm of the same faith, that the stones of fire were the planets. He had, basically, the heavens were his stepping stone to proclaim the worship and glory of God. And the heavens are a wreckage right now, even yes. as we speak. Collisions, uh, planetary shattering, uh, asteroids. Uh, we have uh, we have problems in the old solar system here, but it's to you know take heart because it's going to be repaired. I promise. In and fact, you and I are going to be part of the repair job. Yep. And again, the thing is, we get to watch, if you will. That which was denied to us, watching all the wonders, God's going to let us as a redeemed. Watch how great he is when he brings forth a new heaven, when he brings through a new earth. Can you imagine that? I mean, you know, you get all this Hubble Space Telescopes, you get all the new is designed, and as far as you can see, and yet God just goes like this. I'm done with it. Satan, you're... You're conquered. And see, that's what Ezekiel 28 is. And ladies and gentlemen, pray about Ezekiel 28 because that's what we're talking about here. Steve's book is called Genesis 6 Giants, and it goes into what we've been talking about rather deeply. We also have been offering for some time uh, Steve Dill's book called In the Beginnings, plural, uh, meaning, yes, there was a beginning, but uh, there was another beginning. And uh, I interviewed Jack Langford, who has written at length on the fall of Lucifer and the ancient earth. And this one you'll love. All three of these items that we're calling the Age of the Earth package, you can find it in our online bookstore. You just simply go to prophecywatchers.tv, click on uh, the library, uh, and scroll down. You're going to find the Age of the Earth package. Yours for a gift of $60. Free shipping uh, anywhere in the U.S. of these three items. And believe me, you're going to be excited beyond your imagination because the, the, the whole business of reclaiming the fallen universe is much more exciting than you can possibly imagine. Absolutely. When I go on Coast to Coast, when they call in, there are a lot of Christians looking for answers on talk radio. And my goal has always been to give it the biblical answer. And Gary, again, I say it, everything I've ever written, this is the foundation. Listen, it's a wonderful, wonderful world. And if you know where to look, and if you know uh, what to read, in other words, God's holy scripture, and how to interpret it, ah, what a, what a wonderful situation. And, and Steve, I appreciate your time. Well, thank you. And you know, I'll leave the people with one scripture that says, it's within the heart of a king to search out a matter. And we're the king's kids, and he wants us to have a full understanding of his expression, of his love for us, his redemption, and what he's redeemed us from and who he's redeemed us to. Couldn't have said it better myself. In fact, I couldn't have said it that well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gary Stearman. <clears throat> hey, keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter or follow us at facebook.com slash prophecywatchers. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.